All right, welcome back. Um, I'm glad to see the room is now filled out <laughs> amply. It's very nice. Um, and I'm glad to see my students who I forced to be here from my uh, literary bestsellers of the Islamic world class. We're talking about questions of, uh, of what gets printed and what gets preserved and how things get disseminated. So I want them to be here today. Um, and hopefully they'll be able to stick around. Our speaker t this afternoon um, is Catherine Schwartz, who is a friend of the Digital Islamic Humanities Project, um, and uh, I'm delighted to have her here. Uh, Catherine is an Arabist and historian of the modern Middle East. She is currently the postdoctoral fellow for the Digital Library of the Eastern Mediterranean at Harvard University. She earned her PhD in history and Middle Eastern studies from Harvard in 2015, and her BA in Arabic and Middle Eastern studies from King's College the University of Cambridge, the real Cambridge, in 2008. She is currently revising her dissertation into a book entitled Print and the People of Cairo in the 19th Century. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Schwartz. All right, thank you very much, um, Ilias and the Watson Institute, for having me here today. Um, Ilias is very much the central node in the Islamic digital humanities scene, so it is befitting that Gail should have been unveiling their new website to digitize Arabic sources from the British Library here or in the earlier segment this morning. And many thanks in advance as well to Cynthia Brokaw of the History Department, who's kindly agreed to serve as my discussant to the remarks that I'll give. Cynthia is a book historian of China, and I'm hopeful that in the discussion that we'll have afterwards, we'll find many connections, if not interesting points of divergence between the Near and the Far East. So, over the next 45 minutes or so, while you all tuck into your lunches, I will do the hard work of regaling you with an account of how we might situate what we've been learning about access to new digital sources from the Middle East within a line of scholarship which has grown and draws directly from the study of such sources. And this line of scholarship is known alternately as Middle Eastern book history or the history of the book in the Middle East. Specifically, as my slide here claims, I'll plan on addressing new directions in Middle Eastern book history. But of course, in order to speak about these new directions in Middle Eastern book history, I must first give an account of what book history actually is, how it came to be applied to the Middle East, and what the components of what I'm going to review referring to as the old Middle Eastern book history are. So, what is book history? What is book history? All right, as it happens, this isn't such an easy question to answer because what does and does not count as book history is very much up for debate. It's unclear whether book history is a field, a subfield, a methodology, an approach, or a thematic category, and for that matter, whether the two words that comprise its name, book history, should be capitalized or kept in lowercase letters. People actually debate this. It's also unclear to which discipline book history belongs, as its practitioners range from disciplines such as history, literature, bibliography, art history, media studies, and history of science. While many scholars of these disciplines label themselves as book historians, few universities boast professorships with titles or workshops or departments um, that endorse these labels. And indeed, the very object of focus for book history has expanded to the history of the book beyond the book, which is to say that scholars are no longer just studying books, but also now different media, such as paper, ephemera, and governmental records, in addition to the wider social structures that arose to produce, distribute, consume, consume and preserve these. Book history takes all of these different directions because it is, at its most basic level, an exercise in situating texts within their contexts. And of course, this is something that um, any scholar who uses a text ought to endeavor to do, and of course, most scholars do rely um, upon texts within their research. But book historians take this as their main focus, to fuse the worded content of text to the history of the vessels which surround these words in order to find meaning. Book historians study questions like, what enabled people to produce these works in their particular form, and what did they wish to achieve? Uh, why are most Islamicate manuscripts bound this way with a sort of leather 
envelop around it uh, as opposed to with a sewn binding? Is it perhaps because they stored their books in books, book boxes like this one to the left? Why is this Quran over here made to be so small? Was it intended to be carried uh, close to its owner on their person to serve a sort of talismanic function or to perhaps be consulted multiple times throughout the day? Why on earth in the lower left-hand corner does this manuscript uh, binding still have fur attached to the inside of it. These sorts of questions about why were people producing these things in particular ways? What were they trying to do? Book historians also ask what sorts of culture, a cultural, social, political, and financial forces did works pass through? This here is a 20th century printing of Divan of Abu Nuas, who was the resident bad boy of Abbasid Baghdad, who wrote poetry on sort of homoerotic and, and drunken topics. Well, this book clearly passed. <laughs> he did. <laughs> They're wonderful. And everybody, oh, you've been reading them. And everybody adores his poetry through the ages. And so in spite of censorship regimes, somebody's still bothering to print this up. And obviously, we see here that this is an expurgated copy. Well, what is this censorship regime? What were its rules? How were people who were publishing or writing books operating within them? How were they operating in order to subvert them? Book historians also ask, how were these texts made available to contemporaries? And who engaged these texts? In what ways? And what were they? Uh, what did they think of them? What were they thinking about them? So these are all contemporary photos taken from uh, Egypt, turn of the 20th century. In the top uh, here, we have scholars sat in the courtyard of Al-Azhar Mosque. And they're engaging with texts in the way that we presume scholars would. They're clearly reading them, talking about them. Directly beneath it, we have photos of members of the Egyptian royal Hadivial family, and they're posing with books. They're using them as status symbols. So how are people interacting with these texts? What are they doing with them? What are they, what are they using them to show about themselves? Book historians also ask, what were the processes by which objects survived to be consulted today? This here is a photograph of the Egyptian Hadivial Library, which was founded in the last quarter of the 19th century. And so far as I'm aware, it's the first public library, truly conceived of as being a public library that's established within the Ottoman Empire. And the reason I'm showing this photo is, of course, that in order for such a big library to establish its initial collection, it required disbanding lots of other libraries and longstanding institutions. So book historians are always interested, whenever they encounter a text, uh, they're always interested in the provenance of that artifact. How is it that they're able to actually access it? Now, for at least 100 years, Orientalist scholars of the region have examined how such forces shape their access to the past. And of course, this tradition of writing about books and book culture goes back much longer if one ventures into the Arabic tradition. Uh, probably the most famous early example of this would be the fihrist of Ibn al-Nadim, the 10th century Baghdadi bookseller who creates this catalog of titles that he's aware of, um, as opposed to titles that he's necessarily seen himself. But only in the past three decades has something called book history begun to be applied to the study of the Middle East. So what is the history of book history? Book history as an academic construct is commonly held to have begun in the Annals School <laughs> with Lucien Febvre and Henri Jean Martin in their 1958 coming of the book. This work studied how the spread of ideas via print technology interacted with European culture and society. It influenced the growth of book history within the English-speaking academy, as may be seen through the 1982 publication of Robert Darton's What is the History of the Book? Now, 25 years later, Darton refined this piece in light of fresh considerations and critiques on the development of book history. He used the opportunity of this revisiting to posit that book history functioned as a circuit, which operated through the force of human actors. Interconnected figures such as the author, printers, shippers, smugglers, booksellers, and readers shaped and were in turn shaped by the production, distribution, reception, and survival of texts. All the while, they engaged with and operated under the influence of the wider forces that characterize their place and time. In this explanation, 
Darton appears to have mapped out the insight made by Natalie Zeman Davis in her 1975 Society and Culture in Early Modern France, in which she urged scholars to consider a text as, quote, not merely a source for ideas and images, but as a carrier of relationships. Davis's emphasis on relationships best captures my own understanding of what lies at the core of book history. And it also provides the added benefit that scholars may apply this inquiry to different media and places and times. For as may be detected through Darton's emphasis on the figure of the printer and through the very title of Davis's book, the first scholars of book history generated its framework around one particular phenomenon, the history of printing in early modern Europe. This here is a map uh, courtesy of an atlas made available uh, by the University of Iowa, uh, and it shows uh, within the 50, first 50 years of typographic printing being established in Europe, indeed how many printing presses had uh, spread. This point about printing in Europe being the sort of inspiration for book history is of seminal importance because the center of book history has ever since remained firmly located in the study of typography, or printing via typefaces, in the pre-20th century West. These Eurocentric concerns bore upon the application of book history to Middle Eastern studies, practically and theoretically, when this complex, that is Middle Eastern book history, first emerged sometime during the early to mid-1980s. The reason that these Eurocentric ideas loomed so large is because book history was first applied to the Middle East by Western scholars who were inspired by the tradition of Fevre and Martin and Darton. The earliest English language studies of Middle Eastern book history were produced by librarian scholars like Michael Albin, Jeffrey Atia, or sorry, George Atia and Jeffrey Roper, uh, rather than academics based within particular disciplines. This distinction uh, in professionalization is important because these men and those whom their work inspired tended to structure the past around the material study of texts rather than structuring the past around particular contexts. Their writings therefore tended to revolve around the importance of text to society which they examined from a wide frame of analysis. The traditional narrative for the textual culture of the Middle East that their work fostered went something like this. And again, this is going to be their narrative as opposed uh, to something that I necessarily agree with. So the religion of Islam is centered around the Quran or the encapsulation of the word of God as it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sometime during the first half of the 17th century. The Islamic tradition, therefore, places a great emphasis on orality and the handwritten word. This emphasis on the handwritten word then fed into the development of a rich manuscript culture of libraries and bookish learnedness from capital cities uh, such as Damascus, Baghdad, and Cordoba. From the 1450s, just when Gutenberg invented metal typefaces, the Ottomans rose to power after conquering Byzantine lands and then Arab territories. But the Ottoman sultans resisted printing uh, and on occasion are claimed to have uh, forbidden it and kept it from spreading out of some combination of Islamic prohibition, a general aversion to modern technologies, and from fear of upsetting the livelihoods and sensibilities of copyists and religious scholars. However, this distaste for print only applied to Muslims since other Ottoman religious minorities printed. Uh, so here is a slide of the incidence of printing within the Ottoman Empire between 1490 and 1800. And the takeaway here is that the overwhelming majority of these incidents of printing are occurring among uh, Jewish and Christian Ottoman groups. Jews fleeing Europe circa the 1490s brought typographic presses with them to the Ottoman Empire. And over the centuries that followed, isolated instances of printing occur in the empire among these communities. This pattern continues until the start of the 19th century when Napoleon Bonaparte brings printing presses with him when he invades Egypt and wakes the region up from its proverbial slumber. This is supposed to be uh, the start of the modern era as characterized by Napoleon here having a face off with the Sphinx. He is bringing modernity to the entire Middle East. So the story goes. And this in turn inspired the new Ottoman governor of Egypt, uh, Mehmed Ali, who comes to power after the French leave to import presses to Egypt 20 years later as part of his reforming agenda for the Ottoman province of Egypt. 
Over the rest of the 19th century, a literary renaissance and cultural awakening, or Nachta, develops as a result of printing. And for the first time, people start writing novels and newspapers. And together, these genres play a role in fostering enlightenment, modernity, Islamic modernism, and nationalism. You know you're really modern when you begin printing uh, images of French aristocratic heads on spheres, the revolution. All right. Uh, so now, let's, um, let's move from that traditional narrative of uh, the old Middle Eastern book history, what I'm characterizing as the old Middle Eastern book history, uh, to go through some of the problematic aspects of this narrative. First, we see that this, there's an expectation for a vast temporal and geographic space to be flattened into one unified Islamic textual culture. This simplification of the Islamic world by Middle Eastern book historians tapped into the wider intellectual climate of the academy. For generally speaking, scholars were poised to contemplate the varied region as one monolithic Islamic or Muslim analog to Europe. Moreover, they characterized Middle Eastern civilization as somehow distillable, disconnected from, and in conflict with the West, as may be seen from the works of Bernard Lewis and from points taken issue with by Edward Said. A particularly famous example of this flattening uh, with regard to Middle Eastern textual culture comes from Thomas Francis Carter's 1925 book, The Invention of Printing in China and Its Spread Westward. Carter traced the origins of paper and printing in China and argued that their westward spread played a role in the development of print in Europe. But because the Chinese began printing by at least the 8th century, while European printing began around 1450, he had to explain why the geographical region in between them, that is the Middle East, didn't take to printing. His answer, as seen through the chapter Islam as a barrier to printing, was that there was a long-standing Islamic resistance to print technology. <laughs> Now, a few subsequent scholars, of course, were so normatively blunt as Carter in describing Middle Eastern printing uh, and its wider impact. However, this approach to treating the textual culture of the Middle East as one block proved surprisingly lasting. So too did the general framing of Middle Eastern textual history through the experiences of other regions. This brings me to my second critique of the old Middle Eastern book history, which is that it developed unjustifiably around the European experience of textual culture. What I mean by the European experience of textual culture is the following, that Gutenberg invented metal typefaces sometime around 1450, that over the next 80 years, printing was widely received throughout Europe, and that from then on, European society undergoes a series of intellectual and societal advancements that printing has something to do with. Taking for granted the idea that the European experience of print was but one experience of textual culture, book historians of the Middle East structured their research around Europe. Hence, their work often sought to explain what caused the delay in Middle Eastern print. The overall effect of this thinking within Middle Eastern book history was to divide the Islamic world into the separate ages of manuscript and print. This move implied that technology should determine how we periodize the past as opposed to human agency. But it impacted the study of manuscript and print differently. The manuscript era was pushed into the background and made to appear as the teleological precursor to the age of print. And print, by contrast, became the primary object of concern for Middle Eastern book history, much the same way as it had for book history, as we've seen under Febvre and Martin and Darton that the Islamic world overwhelmingly produced texts by hand long into the modern era gave scholars cause to speculate as to the reasons why something didn't happen didn't happen. Moreover, it allowed them to view the lack of print as a retarding factor in the development of the region. This then leads to my third critique of the old Middle Eastern book history, which is that it overwhelmingly focused on the idea that the spread of printing should mark a revolutionary moment in the history of the Middle East. Most early academic accounts of Middle Eastern book history took it as their premise that the idea that print uh, possessed transformative powers was a true idea. Uh, this argument had been inspired by the 1979 publication of Elizabeth Eisenstein's book, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change. Eisenstein focused on the history of early modern Europe to argue that humanism, the Protestant Reformation, and the scientific revolution 
had all resulted from a communications revolution caused by the spread of print. Her conception of a print revolution had, of course, not been conceived of with explicit regard to the Middle East. However, implicitly, it allowed for the premise that printing distinguished Europe from its traditional adversary, the Ottoman Empire. Scholars who applied Eisenstein's thesis to the Middle East made three intellectual leaps. The first was to strip the idea of print as an agent of change from the context from which it was initially developed. The second intellectual leap that they're making here is to concur that the early modern Islamic world was in a state of decline relative to Europe. And the third intellectual leap that they make, and perhaps the most important one, is to take for granted that the idea of print as an agent of change is in and of itself a debatable idea. This uncritical support of Eisenstein's thesis among Middle Eastern book historians is all the more noteworthy because Eisenstein's thesis sparked a robust deba debate among book historians beginning in the 1980s, which is the same, very same time that Middle Eastern book history is emerging. These uh, critiques of Eisenstein's thesis met with a wide acceptance among book historians, as may be seen through their substantiation in subsequent research. Yet prominent Middle Eastern book historians continue to publish works that pivot around the idea of a print revolution that, and the equivalent understanding of print as an agent of change. Now, one issue with the revolutionary framework is that it presumes a wide expanse upon which the revolution is to occur. Thus, while book histories beyond the Middle East have, for the past quarter of the century, examined particular cities and polities, if not even streets um, within them, those focusing on the region uh, have continued to present the Islamic world as one unit. Another issue with the revolutionary framework is that it requires generalizations about how textual culture worked, instead of directing attention towards specifics. And this is because revolutions aren't supposed to be dealing with specifics, they're supposed to be dealing with vast systems. Yet revolutions are also to comprise deep change. And book histories of the Middle East that invoke this revolutionary framework tend to avoid discussing how developments in textual culture overturn society fundamentally. They also leave open the possibility that the changes that they're observing were in fact delimited in scope, that these changes were subtle, that they were of uncertain consequence, and that these changes also in many ways were reflective of continuity and ultimately that these changes were the product of human agency as opposed to technological agency. All right, so enough with my rant. Now that I have fleshed out what book history is and how it has been applied to the Middle East in, in what I've referred to as the old book history, let me now uh, turn to what some of the great new directions in book history are. Now the overarching pattern of the new study of Middle Eastern book history is that scholars have now begun examining textual culture from within the social and intellectual history of the region, as opposed to the other way around, which is to say that instead of uh, sort of stuffing the social and intellectual history of the region into a sort of grid based upon the materiality of texts, what they're doing is they're, they're finding texts and they're situating them within the context uh, that initially produced them or interacted with them to find useful information then about the text or about that particular society. In general, this has led them to highlight points of connectivity and continuity as opposed to points of rupture. It's also led them to zoom in on geographically and temporally local experiences of texts. As we still know very little about the textual culture of particular places and times relative to what we already otherwise know of their histories, this has opened up several avenues of further research for scholars. So all of you young faces here, I really encourage you to get involved in book history because you will almost by definition be making an original contribution to what we know of, of particular places and, and times as a result. Um, so with regard to my own work, for example, I focus on how mass urban printing developed in Cairo during the mid-19th century. And I study Cairo because it was the first Ottoman city to develop a sustained print culture. So if you recall back a few slides to the um, incidents of Ottoman printing up until the 19th century overwhelmingly occurring among uh, religious minority groups, well, Cairo is um, the first city in which uh, the mainstream Muslim community begins um, engaging with print, which is why I decided to focus um, my research there. Now, as we've seen, 
The story of how this happened is traditionally told as beginning with Napoleon Bonaparte and then blossoming under the yoke of a far-sighted visionary reformer, Mehmed Ali. But to me, this narrative seemed too neat and too vague. In particular, I was skeptical of the disconnect that it imposed between printing and traditional methods for producing texts from Cairo. Cairo, of course, is a phenomenally literate city or literary city, if not liter literate. I was also skeptical of the fact that the wider Kyrene public seemed missing from the inherently public act of printing. So if the difference between a manuscript and a printing is supposed to be that um, hundreds, if not thousands, of printings are supposed to exist, well, where are the hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are supposed to be interacting with these texts within this narrative? So I began my research by going to libraries and calling up all the 19th century Kyrene texts that I could find. And instead of encountering many texts on new educational topics in Egypt, uh, like the natural sciences, what I found were plenty of manuscripts and also printings on traditional topics, like stories on the cat and the mouse, um, or commentaries or super commentaries um, within the religious sciences. So I started reading the closing statements or colophones of these uh, manuscripts and printings. The colophones here are these sort of geographical um, shaped blocks of text which appear at the end of them. And within these colophones, I began noting the people, places, and customs mentioned within them. And from this information, a few things quickly became clear to me. First. Kyrenes were using Mehmed Ali's governmental presses to make printings in the same way that they made their manuscripts, by commissioning them. Now, commissioning was the process by which individuals paid to reproduce texts of their choosing. In this process, they specified how they wanted these texts to look by determining, for example, how fine the scribe's hand should be. So we have a nice account of this here from um, Edward Lane on ordering a manuscript in the 1830s, or in the case of printing, which typefaces should be used. And for some reason, Mehmed Ali actually allowed members of the public to commission printings from the government's presses. The second piece of information that I gleaned from these colophons was that the commissioners who used governmental printings were largely speculating in text for profit. Mm -hmm. They therefore tended to be traders, stationers, and from among the religious scholars mm -hmm. of Al Azhar Mosque. Why religious scholars? Well, obviously they're inherently interested in text, but they also know uh, they're assigning who's going to be reading what. So they know in what numbers to make certain things available. And these groups sort of cohered together and they began vending their printings alongside manuscripts from the longstanding bookseller street within Cairo's central market, Khan al Halili. So here on this map, here, um, number 38 is Al Azhar Mosque, and you can see the bookseller street, longstanding for centuries, radiating down from there. The third thing I learned was that these figures took such an interest in printing that by the 1850s, they established a private printing industry upon the commissioning model, which operated on just this street, in just this area. And it occurred to me that these figures were forging a brand new occupation, that of the private printer. This is totally new um, within Cairo um, and uh, largely within uh, the Ottoman Empire, taking into account sort of printing for profit for the mainstream. Take, for example, someone who might have been Cairo's earliest private printer, Musa Castelli. I went through. Uh, and put together all the various types of texts that Musa produced from his press to get a sense of how his business arose and developed over time. And he's overwhelmingly printing these short stories and books uh, from the religious sciences, and on four occasions, uh, he prints newspaper titles. I also began reading these texts for descriptive information that they held about Musa and how he went about his work in this satirical newspaper that he prints, for example, which every historian in this room would know the title of, Abu Nidara. Um, with this satirical newspaper, its owner slash author, called James Sanua, worked so closely with Musa that alongside the typical content that you'd expect to find in a satirical newspaper, we also get a whole lot of stories about the newspaper's printer, which isn't such a standard thing. One recounts how the author stayed up night after night working with Musa at the press, 
as the one wrote and the other printed in order to get the issue out in time, complaining all the while that they're both filthy and exhausted and covered in soot. Or take this book, Nushat al-Majalis, just here, which is a 15th century work on ethics and piety that Musa's press printed. Its commissioner noted that he ordered the printing of the text to, quote, increase desire for it, since it contained anecdotes and rarities and advice that are not contained in any books like it. But while printing the manuscript, another handwritten copy of Nushat al-Majalis was found between the bindings of the manuscript that they're already in the process of printing. So Musa compared the manuscripts, and what was found in one that exceeded the contents of the other was added in during this process of printing. So as you can see, these asides tell us about how printers went about their work, the conditions they worked in, and also the logic that guided their action and actions. And this logic is different to what we might assume. If you buy an edited uh, version of a 15th century manuscript today that's just been printed, you assume that it's gone through some sort of uh, editorial process. Whereas here, the commissioner and Musa are bragging about the fact that they've sort of cobbled together this Frankenstein text. They're trying to tell the initial audience, hey, you don't need to buy two of these. You, you can get this printing uh, you know, for the, the price of one. So finally, by comparing these sorts of remarks about what they think it is that they're up to, and comparing them to how Egyptians later came to depict printing, I realized that the very idea of printing was experiencing transformation. While Egyptians treated printing as a practical art to accomplish their traditional financial, educational, or communicational goals during most of the 19th century, by the 20th century, different constituencies began presenting printing as a civilizational watershed. So this here is the ex libris book plate of King Fuad, uh, Mehmed Ali's great-great-grandson who rules Egypt between 1936 and 1952. And an ex libris book plate is the sort of um, a book plate that you have printed up and that uh, if you, usually a very grand um, owner of a book library, uh, you would then take your book plate and um, mark books as being within your possession by sort of gluing them into the front page. Now, what we see in Fuad's book plate is a scene transpiring in a barren space beyond Cairo's citadel in which a sheikh and a peasant convene around a printing press. The image suggests that the peasant would take the sheikh's printing and that something of enormous consequence would transpire thereafter. The book plate casts white skin against dark skin, machine power against animal labor, urbanity against the uncultivated, and the ruled lines of print that we see in the center there against sort of primitive swirls of clay which almost look calligraphic. Printing separates these two worlds. But the point was not that merely printing straddled the divide, but that printing was causing this divide in the first place. We're to understand through this book plate that with the peasant's acceptance of the outstretched text, printing would make a sheikh out of him too. The book plate suggests that printing had generated Kyrene civilization and that it could cultivate more civilization yet. And of note here is how well, what the message of this book plate is, how well it aligns with Eisenstein's thesis of print as an agent of change. For the complementary nature of these views of printing's import, laid the ground for the scholarship on Middle Eastern book history that I'm sort of referring to as the old Middle Eastern book history. So putting all of these details about Cairo then back into the wider narrative of the old Middle Eastern book history with which I open this presentation, we already find some major discrepancies between what was happening on the ground in one important city and what was said to have happened. Not only did print not immediately supplant manuscript writing, but in fact, manuscript customs helped to make printing thrive. Moreover, this wasn't just a top-down process, but rather one which drew upon literate members of the community. Some of the most long-standing and active contributors to this process were Cairo's religious scholars. That is, the very same people who were supposed to resist printing outright due to some sort of religious prohibition. And these men collaborated closely with printers, who were in turn forging an industry that overwhelmingly produced traditional texts 
and from time to time took commissions to introduce new genres like the newspaper. But perhaps most importantly of all, this entire process of printing was one which revolved around the agency of people who were using printing as a tool to accomplish traditional goals. To the extent that printing was an agent of change or an agent of civilization, we can see that this was being deployed as a narrative tool. In King Fuad's case, he's making the claim that he's heir to a dynasty that makes Egypt modern. And he's doing that for pretty practical reasons. So I hope that this brief diversion into what has become the basis for my work gives some sense of how much work there's still to be done on the book histories of particular places and times, particularly at the levels of political economy and practice and ideas. But I'd like to move to the last segment of my remarks uh, in which I'll highlight some Middle Eastern book history projects that are telling us new things about the societies under study. Uh, and also by showing off some of the super wonderful sources which uh, may be mined to extend this work to different settings if you all are interested in, in getting involved. So one question that scholars are now exploring is which texts were available to people and what does this tell us, what does this tell us about their intellectual interests? Conrad Herschler, in his great new book, Medieval Damascus, is using a very unique and rare source, a surviving library catalog from an average educational endowment in 13th century Damascus, as opposed to a catalog from a super important library, to explore how the 2,000, 2000 titles contained within it reflected the interests of the patron who endowed the library, but perhaps more importantly, to explore the trends of bookish culture in Damascus at the time among ordinary people. This is an ordinary library. Nellie Hanna has taken a similar tack with regard to early modern Cairo in her In Praise of Books. Instead of library catalogs, she's used lists of books found among the probate records of estates that were disbanded by courts. And with this information, she's argued that Cairo had a thriving and literate middle class during the 16th to 18th centuries that expanded not owing to the development of printing, but rather that these, this literate middle class expanded because of the growing availability of cheap paper. To get a sense of what it was that people were reading, there are yet more sources to mine the closer in time to the present that you get. Ahmed al-Shamsi has been visiting private libraries that are still intact, which were first bounded together in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in my own work, I've been relying on booksellers' catalogs that list the texts which were available for sale. And sometimes, if you're really lucky, uh, these booksellers' catalogs come with prices listed within them, uh, which gives you a sense of who actually might have been able to acquire which text. And if you crunch uh, the numbers that they list, you find super interesting insights, like the notion that this bookshop, at least, mainly stocked low-cost texts instead of high-cost ones, clearly working under the business model that the idea is to get more bodies through the door to be able to buy cheap things, as opposed to hoping to only sell highbrow texts that perhaps one or two people might buy. Another question which scholars have been exploring is how did people disseminate texts? This has grown out of the realization that processes of distribution and consumption can tell us about how texts were actually used. Boris Librens has written an amazing paper which follows ownership inscriptions noted within library catalogs worldwide and within the manuscripts that he's consulted himself to recreate the inventory of a late 18th and early 19th century bookseller slash poet from Damascus. And he's shown that this figure actually rented out the books within his library to people who were then hand copying these texts for themselves. So if you wonder how can a super literary society thrive before the age of print, well, there, here's one example of a business model in which this was possible. Studying inscriptions doesn't just tell us about one particular figure or practice. Studying in inscriptions can also tell us about intention, about wider networks, and about changing intellectual interests. For example, the inscriptions within the title page of this treatise, uh, printed in 1882, tell us that the treatise was about nine years after its printing acquired into the personal collection of one individual, and that about 10 years uh, later, it was then committed by somebody to an Islamic charitable endowment, or waqf, 
for perpetuity. And that in this case, perpetuity lasted only a few decades because sometime in the 20th century, as American universities began beefing up their holdings in Middle Eastern texts with the development of the field of Middle Eastern studies, this treatise was acquired by Harvard University. All right. Um, Ami Ayalon, in his new book, The Arabic Print Revolution, um, <laughs> has begun exploring how late 19th century printed periodicals were distributed by networks of vendors and even by the newly established postal system. For this work, he's relied upon the advertisements at the tops of these periodicals, and he's also uh, been using the lists of subscribers whose names would actually get printed up within these periodicals in order to gain some sort of sense of who the readership for these periodicals might have been. Ephemera, like menus, calling cards, stationery, and the tops of newspapers, highlight the role that commerce played in textual production, insofar as they these things usually tell uh, their original clients uh, or their prospective clients about the amazing deals that they might get uh, should they um, frequent these establishments. And by the way, these deals are sometimes really rather different than you might expect. For example, a standard newspaper banner often encouraged people to save up the issues to the newspaper that they were subscribing to so that they could have them bound at the end of the year. And it turns out that people were actually doing this, uh, which suggests that contrary to how we might value a newspaper, uh, or original uh, consumers of these products, some of them at least, might have determined that they were worthy of permanence. They were worthy of investing money into. There have also been moves to study the intellectual contents of text, to understand the canonization of learning over time, and also to map intellectual geographies. So for the past two years, I've been a part of a team uh, led by Melika Zegal at Harvard called Afkar, in which we're merging qualitative and quantitative readings of Arabic periodicals to map the real and imagined networks that they reflected. This here is a still from what will ultimately be a moving graphic, which maps the origin, uh, the place of origin and the endpoint of fatwas sent into the Islamic modernist periodical Al Minar. In this case, we're asking questions like, what was the network that Al Minar reflected through its, fat, uh, through its fatwas? How did this network develop over time from issue to issue? And to what extent is this network unique? Is this network here reflecting uh, standard shipping lines, for example? Uh, is it reflecting longstanding communications among uh, Muslims? A final question that scholars have been posing is how do developing trends in writing reflect wider societal changes, like the emergence of the citizen within an empire which traditionally treated groups of people as subjects rather than ruling them as individuals? By amassing and then reading through the contents of distinctive genre that emerged around Damascus in the 18th century, Dana Sajdi, in her wonderful Barber of Damascus, examines the development of the layman's chronicle among non-elite figures like farmers and lowly clerks and a barber. And looking at the rise of individuality from the bureaucratic perspective, one might try to understand the growing role of the government in regulating transactions by studying how paperwork bears witness to this larger process, as over the course of the 19th century, governments increasingly issued forms which inserted them into almost all realms of life, like land ownership and marriage and wills and sales. And in the case of Egypt, in the far corner there, um, the government even began issuing instructions on how to fill forms out, step by step, a true sign of modernity. Um, so one um, might also explore how and why traditional manuscript genres, like the petition of the ruler, got converted into print. In most polities, if someone had a grievance, they'd have it written up and sent in to the ruler in the hope that the ruler would redress this grievance. And what we see at the turn of the 20th century is that people began printing these up and circulating them within and between towns, such that hundreds of people would actually sign their names either via signature or via their seal, which was an engraving of their names. Well, what do documents like these tell us about perceived and real communities? And what do they tell us about changes in the expression of individualism? So if we look at all of these seals closely, you'll notice that one of them is not like the other. Uh, 
in the very far left-hand corner, if you zoom in, you'll see that Hassan Hafiz took the very bold and avant-garde step of actually reproducing his likeness in the serial. And he considers himself a mustachioed fez wearer. So sort of looking at printings for these manuscript traces tell us a, a, an enormous amount, even if it's at this uh, level of microhistory. So as you can see, the sources to be used for this work don't differ greatly from those of other topics of inquiry within Middle Eastern studies. What distinguishes this line of research is the creative approach to the sources which scholars must employ. And I'm concluding now, but digital initiatives have made certain sources accessible to scholars in new ways, informed how they conduct their work, and provided them with quantitative tools to revisit longstanding qualitative questions and to pose new ones. So on the topic of seals here, with regard to accessing sources in new ways, the Chester Beatty Library, for example, has created a digital library of the seals from within the manuscripts in their collections. And the rationale is that researchers consulting other manuscripts elsewhere Finding those seals within those manuscripts can then go back and actually recre recreate the original libraries of earlier owners. On the topic of digital libraries, the process of digitization has opened up new opportunities for contributing to research. So for my postdoc, for example, I'm working to create a digital portal that will connect all of the great and emerging websites that are coming up online so that scholars will have a port of call such that if you're interested in doing research in the digital Islamic uh, humanities sort of scene, you know where to go first in order to point you outward to everything that um, hopefully exists. Digital initiatives have, however, raised important considerations over the accessing of and approach to texts. For example, many Islamic digital resources available today come from Western libraries rather than Middle Eastern ones. They therefore tend to forward a particular canon of texts, which is oftentimes made up of formal sources and usually fancy formal sources, rather than the ephemeral ones or the ones that people would have been interacting with on a daily basis. Moreover, not all of these resources are accessible to everyone. And of those digital resources freely available to everyone in theory, various countries' copyright laws and bandwidth capacities limit users' access to these sources. Another issue facing Islamic digital, uh, Islamic digital libraries is that the best resources and the best funded resources are inspired by particular ideological agendas, which is very helpful to Rich Nielsen, of course, who works on Salafists. But otherwise, this means if you don't work on Salafism, this is a binding constraint upon the projects that scholars might actually undertake. So if you recall the Afkar project that I just showed you that I'm working on at Harvard with this team, uh, we're using Al-Manar because it's an Islamic modernist periodical. We can't use Al-Mashriq, which was published at the same time, which is a Catholic periodical, because it hasn't been hand-keyed yet. Uh, and we won't do it because we're very lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so the last concern that I'll mention is that digital libraries tend to reinforce the idea of the fixity of a given text. That's to say that if one digital copy of a text exists online, we tend to assume that we need not consult other copies. Uh, so, for example, uh, the University of Ankara has done an amazing service by digitizing uh, their holdings of um, Takvimi Vika'i, the um, sort of first uh, imperial gazette that was issued out of Istanbul. And wonderfully, they've also included um, it's things that perhaps scholars might not want to look at, like the water stains here on um, this blank sheet and, and the hand inscriptions within them. But including this sort of material is important, as is always remembering that you, as a scholar, ought to be consulting many versions of these individual texts. Because even in printings, um, printers often made stop gap changes if they noticed that there was an error. error. And of course, um, different texts have different markings showing how people actually engaged with them. These texts are always, um, first and foremost, objects that possess histories of their own. So um, I hope this presentation has given you a sense of what book history is and how it's been applied to the Middle East. Again, um, the more the merrier. There's plenty of work to be done. Uh, so I do hope that you'll all get involved because as a multifaceted pursuit um, falling within an interdisciplinary field of study, really the possibilities for research are endless. Thanks. Thank you.
Catherine. It was wonderful. Um, I'd love. I'd like to introduce now um, somebody I'm very happy is joining us. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our workshop this morning, um, Professor Cynthia Brokaw is the Chen Family Professor of China Studies in the Department of History and former chair of the Department of History at Brown. She is the author of several books, including Commerce and Culture, The Cibao Book Trade in the Qing and Republican Periods, a study of a rural book publishing industry active in distributing popular texts throughout South, uh, southern China. And uh, Professor Broca will be responding um, briefly to uh, Catherine's talk, and then we'll have an open discussion. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Elias, for inviting me um, uh, to the workshop, and thank Catherine, too, for presenting us with such a rich and wide-ranging paper. I'm going to try to keep my comments very brief so that we have plenty of time to, to talk about it. Okay. Now, as a student of early modern Chinese book history, I am very sympathetic to Catherine's call for a new book history, and I even like to imagine uh, that I am practicing it uh, myself. I also share many of her frustrations over the hegemic position that European book history holds in the field. And I'd like here to indulge first in a little sort of comparative complaining um, and then move on to reflect on the configuration of the new um, uh, book history and uh, how not only Middle Eastern uh, but also other regional book histories need to be written in response to questions that arise naturally and organically out of the regional context avoiding as much as possible assumptions made by historians of the Western book about what book culture and book history should uh, be. Uh, for Chinese and East Asian historians of the book, perhaps the greatest frustration in conversations with historians of the Western book has been the Western obsession with movable type. Uh, in particular, the assumption that it is the only real uh, or important technology of print. Uh, printing was invented in China probably sometime in the 7th century, uh, perhaps earlier. And by the 9th century, Chinese printers were producing works as magnificent as this uh, 1868 scroll of the Diamond Sutra. Uh, but it was woodblock printing, uh, printing off characters cut in relief um, on wooden blocks, that was the technology that produced um, uh, this and other similar texts. And it's this kind of printing, this kind of uh, printing technology, woodblock or xylography, uh, that spread then from China to Korea and uh, Japan. Now, of course, uh, to complicate matters, uh, Chinese craftsmen also invented movable type. An earthenware type um, in the 11th century, between 1041 and uh, 1048. And then uh, later, uh, wooden movable type um, several centuries thereafter. Uh, this is a matrix of, of uh, wooden movable type. Uh, metal movable type was invented actually by Korean workers at the court of the Kingdom of Goryeo uh, in the late, uh, for, or by the late 14th century. And a succession, uh, this is a book that was printed with uh, metal movable type in, in uh, uh, Korea. Uh, and these are some examples of the, uh, the, the types. Um, and then finally, uh, what they would look like. This is actually the uh, Korean vernacular um, with some uh, Chinese characters in a set in a, in a matrix. Uh, a succession of Korean rulers supported the refinement of this technology, which was used primarily to publish government documents and uh, moral uh, texts for broad circulation. But woodblock printing was, um, as in China, uh, the dominant uh, uh, form of, of publishing. And in Japan, which had imported both technologies, uh, woodblock uh, and movable type uh, publishing from uh, uh, China and Korea, um, in the uh, mid 17th century, actually abandoned movable type. Uh, and publishers there made a very conscious decision uh, to uh, uh, shift operations to woodblock printing, to xylography. Now, from the perspective of historians of the Western book, uh, this preference for woodblock over movable type printing is quite perplexing. Uh, why choose a primitive, a labor-intensive technology over an evidently, um, I think because uh, European, uh, more modern one? 
uh, for some scholars, and I admit these are a, a minority, um, it seems that woodblock printing did not really count as printing at all, um, a judgment that has led some to slight or even dismiss the very real presence of print um, in Chinese and East Asian society um, in China, certainly from the 10th century on. The Western fascination with movable type has had another unfortunate influence on the field. It has created, because of the geopolitical dominance of the Western powers in um, modern uh, history, a pressure for scholars of East Asia to devote an inordinate amount of effort to research on the development of movable types. Um, in this regard, I feel particular sympathy uh, for Korean book scholars who have been encouraged by their government uh, recognizing the interest from the West and eager to prove Korea's contribution to world history to focus uh, research on the invention and evolution of, movable, of metal movable type in Korea to the exclusion of work on what was in fact, until the 19th century, by far the most important uh, print technology, xylography. Now, of course, if we, as Catherine has suggested, um, we should, uh, pay attention to the context in which these technologies were developed and practiced, we would discover that there were in fact excellent reasons uh, for the East Asian preference for woodblock printing over movable type. It is not just a mysterious preference for uh, a primitive technology. The language of print in East Asia was classical Chinese, a language of well over 10,000 characters, and some would place the total at uh, several times that, uh, and to create a font of that size, or even half that size, would require an enormous outlay of capital. And so it is little surprise that the most frequent publishers of movable type texts were either the imperial court or very wealthy merchants. Xylography allowed craftsmen to reproduce the beauties of calligraphy, highly valued in East Asian societies in, in print. Um, for example, uh, this page uh, from a mid-18th century uh, Japanese text. Um, you can see the kana calligraphy here would be very, very difficult um, uh, to reproduce in, in movable type. It's much easier to, to do this on a, on, a, on a woodblock. The low labor costs of the early modern era and the simplicity of woodblock technology, it really required just a simple set of tools, meant that capital costs were relatively low and the ease with which technology could be transported also facilitated the spread of printing throughout East Asia. And indeed, this is uh, the focus of my own uh, particular research, is a study of how just the, the portability of this technology requiring just a handful of tools and obviously supplies of hardwood um, and, and paper uh, uh, made possible the diffusion of, of print um, uh, throughout most of, of what we call China proper, um, in the late Ming and the Qing, that is from, say, the 16th century uh, through uh, the 19th uh, century. Xylography allowed the publisher great flexibility in decisions about print runs because he could always print new runs of a text off his stored woodblocks. He could adjust the number of copies he made at any particular time uh, to the demands um, of either, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the demands of the market uh, without running the risk faced by the letterpress publisher of either underestimating demand and having to go to the expense of resetting the type for a, a, new, a new run, or overestimating demand and being stuck with a large stock of unsellable uh, books. Thus, the popularity of xylography can be attributed both to its suitability to the East Asian context, it's, it's a natural choice given um, uh, uh, that context, and then to certain advantages in business management that it offered over uh, movable type. Now, I could give you many other examples of ways in which um, expectations uh, derive from the study of the Western book um, of what book production and book culture should uh, uh, look like um, have shaped, or, or perhaps I should say distorted, uh, the study of non-Western book histories. Um, but I do not want uh, here either uh, to wallow in indignation, uh, however pleasurable um, uh, that might be, um, or to make these comments just about um, East Asia. Uh, I would suggest that we, um, and by we I mean those of us working in different regional or national book histories outside of Europe, begin talking a little more often and a little more deeply to one another, uh, to think very broadly about a range of textual methods of transmitting knowledge and ideas, 
methods um, that would include manuscripts, printed texts, official documents, electronic print, and the sort of ephemera that Catherine uh, alludes to, um, and that might challenge the very notion of what a book is. Uh, we lead to learn of one another's work so that, uh, first of all, we do not repeat the mistake of Thomas Carter, who, as Catherine has noted, in the course of writing what is a pioneering work on Chinese printing, flattened uh, the richly varied manuscript book cultures of the Middle East into a, monolith a monolithic Islamic uh, book culture. But we also need, I think, to answer the implicit challenge of Western book history uh, by explaining or again, as Catherine has put it, by contextualizing the different publication and transmission strategies, different approaches to reading uh, and the uses of texts, different attitudes towards the control of texts, and so on, that we find in our different book histories. We have to work together to provincialize, or again, we could just simply say contextualize European book history in um, world history. Uh, we might even collaborate on efforts to infiltrate certain scholarly organizations. I am thinking here in particular of the Society for the History of Authorship, Reading, and Publishing, now overwhelmingly dominated by um, uh, Western uh, book scholars. Uh, the project that uh, Catherine is proposing requires um, to use a, a very old-fashioned um, and perhaps a little crude, but I think still useful um, uh, 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 contrast, an emic approach to our subject, that is, a method that studies a region's or a nation's book history from within, um, asking questions that arise naturally from that region's or that nation's culture and society, and answering them through the examinations of sources possibly uh, unique uh, to that region or nation. Um, in this particular case, it means to just repeat one of, one of the many insights that Catherine includes in her paper. Uh, it means to see the developments that led to the growth of a commercial print culture in mid-19th century Cairo and the particular nature of that, that commercial print culture as the result of the practice of commissioning uh, textual production, the practice used in manuscript uh, culture, applied now in a new technological uh, regime. The focus then shifts from Napoleon's role in introducing the printing press to the particular way in which the new technology was used to shape, uh, to sort of continue um, a, a book culture and shape a, a distinctive uh, book culture. I think this is clearly the way um, uh, to advance the study of um, uh, book histories and book culture. Um, but I do want to end here, uh, perhaps somewhat contrarily, by making a small plea, too, uh, for the value of the etic approach, as long as it is taken in a spirit of, of resistance, of, of contest. Um, just as an aside here, I do have to confess that my own interest in studying Chinese book history came from reading Robert Darnton, Natalie Siemens Davis, Roger Chartier, and Michel de Certeau, among many, many others. Um, I would feel a little dishonest if I did not admit that many of their ideas, uh, Chartier's notion of appropriation, uh, de Certeau's of reading as poaching, um, have not um, influenced uh, my thinking about uh, book history in China. Um, so there is that. I have to acknowledge a kind of debt uh, uh, to, to these uh, scholars. Um, but to go back to explain my plea for the usefulness of continuing engagement, or perhaps I should say continuing struggle, uh, with the negative questions of European book historians about other histories. The assumption of a normativity that they make when they ask, why didn't uh, printing catch on in Islamic culture? Or why didn't the Chinese abandon primitive uh, xylography for modern uh, movable type? Uh, the assumption that the Islamic culture uh, should have embraced printing and that the giant Chinese should have converted uh, uh, to movable type, as irritating um, as it is, has been a real spur, at least in the China field, to thinking about the distinctive technology of Chinese printing and how that technology shaped the nature of the publishing business, the spread of print, and uh, through the material form of books, the practices of reading um, in China. So in some ways, it is through resistance um, to this uh, view that we have had to think about and do research that has um, uh, very um, nicely able us, enable us to answer questions that arise naturally from the Chinese context, 
and have been able to advance our understanding of uh, Chinese book history. So thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. Uh, I feel like we've been treated to uh, several wonderful presentations today. I've learned a huge amount, and the reaction on Twitter is uh, concurs. So, uh, if it's if it says so on the internet, then we can believe it. Um, so we have, uh, I guess, about a half an hour for discussion, and um, maybe I can just ask a question that picks up on uh, what Cynthia just said at the end there. Um, directing it towards Catherine. And maybe, do you want to come up and sit at the mic so that uh, we can capture your responses, um, both Professor Broca and uh, Catherine? So the question is, um, it may be uh, the, the question about why uh, printing came late or didn't come or wasn't accepted um, in the Islamic world. It might be an uncomfortable question, and it may have been uh, answered incorrectly in the past, and it might have been uh, presume things that were not accurate, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it um, a bad question or um, an uninteresting question at the least. So I'm curious as to whether you can gesture towards how a new book history actually answers that question, because what you've done is direct our attention to the other questions that new book history is dealing with, and, the, and that's hugely important. But I wonder whether um, the old question is something that new, big, new book historians are still interested in. All right. Well, no, it's a it's a fair it's a fair point. Generally, why why not questions are always good um, parlor sort of questions. I think that if you're going to do them historically, you can't really go there unless the contemporaries that you're studying are also asking why not. If if they're engaging um, with this question of why aren't we printing, what's what's keeping us from printing, etc., you can actually engage with these sources and and develop. Um, a defensible response to it. Um, but I agree with you. It, it is a sort of a thing worthy of um, studying th this why not question insofar as one of the things that I've taken on in my um, research is um, the evolution of the why not question within um, the historiography on the region. So um, I have a, a paper actually coming out in, in book history soon, I hope, which follows the history of the rumor that the Ottoman sultans banned print. And it turns out that if you go into the Encyclopedia of Islam today, you will see that the Ottoman sultans banned print. But if you follow the paper trail, it's actually a 16th century uh, Frenchman who uh, includes this in his sort of description of, um, I think, Gutenberg. Uh, sort of a book of uh, biographies of illustrious people of the time. And from there, this um, notion of the ban goes through a sort of academic telephone game where you see lots of people sort of contorting it. First, you know, uh, anybody who consumes printing is punishable by death. And then eventually, it's all, only Muslim people, you know, uh, uh, and it's only the people who are printing the, the text as opposed to necessarily Jewish groups, et cetera. And then in the 19th century, you actually see um, Ottoman writers and um, uh, Ottomans writing in Turkish and in Arabic um, who begin incorporating this into their own writings of, of the history of printing. So insofar as you're sort of studying this question through um, the sources, it's, it's really profitable because um, I suppose you're, you're giving a sense of how, um, how a sort of wider uh, context for why not um, came, came about how it creates sort of facts of, of its own um, that need to be dis disproven or looked into. Hi. Um, thank you very much, both of you. I'm Matt Amtuxos. Um, I'm a visiting scholar here from Boston University. Um, I'm, I would myself uh, talk about my work as intellectual history that I'm doing currently. So I wouldn't talk about it as book history, but it's very much <laughs> along, along the lines that you've been talking about. I have several questions, uh, but we can always discuss them later on. Um, one of the things that the Ottomans themselves did in the, at the end of the 19th century, and Egyptians were also part of it, was 
to make the argument for printing themselves, very much so. So what do we do, do, do with that is part of, I think, uh, Cynthia's plea. Um, we have to look into that and we have to uh, understand that. Uh, so that's part of the vice, I guess, <laughs> that right. Ilyas was also um, mentioning. Um, but, uh, and I was thinking about a lot about calligraphy mm -hmm. as, as very also very important for uh, the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I'm sure Catherine has done work on that too, b because commissioning of calligraphy is, it has a different, um, you know, place in uh, Islamic culture or whatever you want to call it, civilization. And calligraphy is very much part of the culture. I would say, and it remains so until the 20th century. And um, another venue of looking at um, uh, Middle Eastern book history would be um, like commissioning or other in, uh, ingenious ways of contributing to uh, book culture would be some of the Ottomans that in Istanbul uh, were uh, the commissioning themselves to, in a way, if you will, they would, um, especially in journalism, uh, in uh, printing of periodicals, um, they, they would establish the periodical, they would be the editor, the typesetter, <laughs> they would do everything in the uh, milieu of printing uh, a periodical. And then what they wrote in the periodical would turn into a textbook by another print house, by, by another publication house. So there, there are so many relations there that would also contribute to a book culture that could be considered. And then another idea is, um, I just came to read um, a, a new piece on urban photography uh, by Ahmed Ersoy. Uh, and uh, he talks about the place of the journals um, in in the development of Ottoman pho photography. And he takes it to many different places, but one of the things that he's, he's talking about in, in terms of the book culture in the 19th century is images. And so it's the book culture is not really textual culture in that sense, but it's also a culture of image. And we have to take that into account. And many of the things that you t showed and you digitize are uh, related to images. So there, the relationship of text and image is, I think, very, very important, and we need to think of that, too. Finally, I know I just spoke too much, but it's because you guys excited me so much. Um, how about print capitalism? How about this notion? And how, I mean, you know, Anderson, but um, how, how, how also about the French idea of, um, what, what do they call it, age of paper, l'âge du papier? Uh, what, what do we make of those? Uh, I guess I should have asked that with my first remarks. But thank you so much. Well, um, I mean, I, I concur <laughs> with all of the points that you're um, that you're making about um, studying calligraphy and manuscript alongside print. Of course, um, a lot of people s still take notes um, by hand, etc. That survives um, to this day. Um, also, as I hope I gestured to within the talk about the sort of um, taking up um, within the sort of intellectual history of, of these regions, also of this idea that print mm -hmm. civilizes. I'm, I'm still resistant to, to the sense that this is true, but I absolutely agree that uh, the way in which um, this idea is spread uh, should be charted. Within the Egyptian case, at least, it is very much taken from Europe and the, the way that I um, am convinced of this is because the first sort of books that give a history of printing in the, the 19th century, they're giving um, an account of printing in Europe and they're sort of transliterating Mainz to Mayence, et cetera, and they'll sort of write, like as everybody knows, print is the mother of civilization. And then they go ahead and they try to give an account of all of the incidents of printing within the Ottoman Empire starting in the 1490s and then, and then going into Mount Lebanon, et cetera. So uh, where are these ideas coming from? How are they being deployed? How are they evolving is, is enormously important. I also agree um, with your point about um, the, the sliding line between printers and publishers and journalists. Um, Again, with the with the people that I'm 
trying to look at, this is very much the forging of an occupation. And there are all of these changes taking place, and they're um, not entirely clear cut. There are a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Um, and and uh, for example, Ahmed al Shamsi is studying the rise of the editor, Muhakkir, um, from the Musahir. Uh, so wh where, where are these things coming from? What are the delineated roles? Until you reach the, the 20th century, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily um, come about so clearly. Um, as opposed to, a, a, on the topic of um, Anderson and, and print um, capitalism, I very much um, uh, agree the importance of s sort of studying this from the perspective of, of commerce, um, as Cynthia does in in her work, I think it's hugely important, and, and that's what I'm trying to do within my own. In terms of how print capitalism shapes nationalism, uh, which is something that Anderson argues about, I, it doesn't necessarily work that way um, in the Middle East. So for example, uh, in Anderson's print capitalism, you have um, vernaculars that are creating nations, whereas in uh, the Middle East, uh, you, you don't have um, vernaculars creating nations, you have this one big Arabic language. Uh, or on, I'm sorry. sorry. For other Ottoman languages or other, other Middle Eastern languages, there is vernacular. What you're saying is only about Arabic. Uh, but to, to, reflect, a na are, to reflect a nation state is what I mean to say. Not that these vernaculars don't exist. Of course, they absolutely exist. But they don't necessarily carve out nation states the way that French and German um, do in the and Spanish in the in the European setting. Well, in the Balkans, they do. Maybe if but maybe we can, yeah, we could talk about. We could talk about. Yeah. I um, have very little to add. I mean, I can only talk about China. Um, uh, and paper is um, not a, a particular problem from I would say the Song Dynasty, that is say the tenth, eleventh century on, particularly in the South, it, it, bamboo um, it comes to be the major. Uh, material that is used to make paper and it's wild, widely uh, abundant. So, so that is not really a challenge to the Chinese printing industry in the South. The North is a little bit more complicated, but they could always import paper from the, from the South. Print capitalism, um, uh, very interesting. There's a, a, a book that has been uh, written on um, basically the introduction of mechanized movable type from the West um, and how that is sort of taken over then by Chinese publishers who the author calls uh, print capitalists. Uh, he's actually not all that interested in the, the development of nationalism, but, but just more the business of, of, of publishing. But, but it is quite an interesting study. Um, drifting a little bit from the point, but still talking about things that Anderson is very interested in. Really wonderful book on uh, Japanese um, print history, or book history, Japan in Print, where the author launches a kind of implicit, very gentle challenge to, to Anderson. She is arguing, in this age of woodblock printing, um, Japanese publishers create what she calls a library of public information um, travel guides, uh, maps, uh, 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 directories to government offices that circulate so widely um, that there is created this kind of common um, uh, book culture uh, and with relatively high literacy rates in Japan at the time of the Tokugawa period you're getting the beginnings of the development of a, of a kind of sense of, she doesn't never uses the word nationalism, but she's clearly moving in that direction. You're getting a concept of the nation, where people who are living you know, in the far south um, can understand and envision you know, what is happening in Edo, uh, mm -hmm. and that this, this shared book culture begins to create a, a sense of the nation. I was certainly not trying to advocate print capitalism. I just wanted to, oh, yeah, no, I, no. I just wanted to Hi, I'm Ian Strawn. I'm the Middle East Studies Librarian and faculty um, in archaeology. And thank you both for these wonderful um, discussions that we've been having. So I wanted to push a little bit more on the, the, the why not question, because right, it comes with all these caveats, which is that, first and foremost, um, there were printing presses in the Middle East prior to Napoleon. Right? Um, we have, it, it's just the, it's, the institutional sponsor for them is the church, rather than, or in most cases, right? Um, or monasteries and, and, and um, so, and at the same time, right, we have Arabic printed 
works coming from Europe since the 16th century. Um, how, how widely distributed they are um, within the Middle East, that's, a, that's, a, that's another question. Um, but certainly, um, the Middle East is importing tons of paper from France in particular. Um, so, you know, the, the, these, uh, these networks are already there in terms of the, 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 the book culture relationship. So, where does that fit into um, the new book history? Um, where, does, where do those early printing presses before Napoleon um, have a role to, to, or is that just this this aside that we just won't mention? We don't want to talk about. I, I don't mean I don't mean to suggest that at all. In fact, I created that map of all of them there. Uh, what I'm resisting is this linear narrative determined by the technology that we should say, okay, from 1490 here, and then jump, you know, several religions and and spaces to then study the next press here. Um, you then see sort of nationalist historiography that sort of says the first printing press in Lebanon. Well, of course, Lebanon wasn't a nation state when um, you know, this, this press um, would have come out. What, I, what, I, uh, what I'm hoping to do is to encourage people to actually study these um, distinctive communities and the way in which they're printing um, in time. Uh, and then perhaps when the hard work is done, uh, once we know names and we can connect them, or, or we, we can sort of chart which uh, typefaces are moving where, uh, these things can perhaps get put back together again and then, and then theorized into more of um, a linear narrative. Um, in terms of um, these Jewish and, and Christian Ottoman printing endeavors, um, when I was looking at them, not super, super carefully, because again, I, my, my heart is in Cairo in the 19th century. When I was looking at them, what struck me is that um, they're very much for their particular community. So they're written in Judeo-Arabic, for example, they're of the Haggadah. Um, when it comes to the Christian communities, uh, they're not necessarily uh, bringing uh, these printing presses with them from Europe, but in fact, they are going <laughs> to Europe and they're being trained. Um, and given presses to bring back with them, or missionaries are coming and giving them um, presses. Oftentimes in the early modern era, the, the Christian communities that are printing, uh, for long-standing reasons, nothing to do with printing, tend to be up, uh, perched in hills, <laughs> not easily accessible. So who, where are these works circulating? If you actually look uh, within the inscriptions of these works, it's phenomenal. There's a, a massive sort of tree of people within the, the community, sort of the priests, for example, who uh, acquires the book moves on. So um, I suppose that would be sort of my answer to, to that question. But, but paper is absolutely a phenomenal um, topic of study. Terence Waltz has sort of studied how um, paper comes from uh, Europe overwhelmingly um, during the early modern period, that it sort of reaches Cairo, and some of the good stuff gets picked off. And then um, it is traded uh, westwards across um, Africa, so really interesting sort of chains of uh, transmission through through watermarks and things, and of course, um, this is enormously important. Now, that was really interesting, and I'm wondering, you mentioned you had two uh, books up there from um, Anne Blair and Leah Price, and they've also been very involved, maybe as you have, with note-taking and alternative forms of using books, not just for repository of text, but also for repository of your own notation on the text. And I'm wondering, can you give us any feedback on what you've seen, perhaps, with that as you've investigated your research area? Um, have you seen, is there a, if there's a corresponding change, let's say, in the volume or production point of text from Cairo in the 19th century, have you also seen changes in the way that those texts are used, not just as um, repositories of printed word, but perhaps, as you mentioned, um, collections of newspapers. I'd be really curious to see what was that used for, because if you already read it, what was it for? Was it to show that you had a collection of newspapers and therefore you've invested, just like some of us save our old magazines, right? Um, uh, but also the note-taking aspect. Is there anything you glean from your uh, research there? Uh, so um, Anne Blair and Leah Price are very much sort of my heroes and, and, my, and my teachers. I greatly admire their work. And I think that they're spot on in sort of focusing on these annot annotations because the one assumption that you can usually make with a manuscript is that somebody wanted it. 
um, the person copying it or the person ordering somebody to copy it or the person putting notes in it, they wanted it. Whereas with a printing, somebody wanted to print that text, but you can't really say um, of all of the printed texts that then get out there in the world, whether or not they were ever opened or read or used. So focusing on these annotations gives you a sense of, of whether people were engaging with these texts and, and um, how. When it comes to um, Cairo, I have to admit that um, I suppose the period in time in which I'm focusing on doesn't give me a great chance to have big, broad sort of takeaways of, of changes. Um, but uh, one thing that I do notice is that um, for from maybe the 1820s until the 1860s or so, it's very common to put your seal in your book um, or, or to write your name. And afterwards, perhaps because more texts were becoming available, um, the sort of significance of them changed such that people didn't necessarily feel obliged um, to mark their property in quite the same way. Um, but, but I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Working? Okay. Um, so I actually think I've spent time on that book alley in Cairo. Um, and I didn't actually understand what I was seeing. I got led into a printing press back there at one point, because um, I was doing work at LSR. Could you talk a little bit more about the interaction between the religious class and the rise of that alley? I mean, they're, they're geographically located next to each other, I think, for a reason, but I don't actually know. Um, and how the religious class, whether they were unified in thinking that this was a great new way to uh, ease the cost of giving manuscripts to their students, uh, or whether there were splits, was there a politics around this? If some scholars wanted manuscripts to be more freely available, some scholars wanted manuscripts to be uh, reserved for a variety of reasons to a l more limited uh, readership. Anything you know about that sure. would be very fascinating. So um, with regard to I mean, practically every major um, city within uh, the Middle East, if you read sort of um, older depictions of them, descriptions of them, I'm sure Elias can speak to this, there's always a sort of bookseller street that's around any important mosque. It makes sense. This is the literate community. These are the people who are um, engaging in composing, um, training people um, in text. So. I, I don't know um, too, too much about uh, the rise of, of this street, which I'm looking at in the 19th century, of course, because it's basically as old as Al-Azhar's is what I'd assume. Um, I'm sure that Andre Raymond, who has an incredible social history of Cairo, uh, might have something more um, to say about it during the early modern period. Um, but in terms of um, how Azharites were using printing, Again, it taps into this uh, question. Um, insofar as there was some sort of a, a resistance, it's not really written about. I haven't sort of seen it. What I am seeing are the names of those who've been involved uh, within it, and they're using it to um, sometimes uh, publish their own compositions. Um, sometimes they're using it to publish the compositions of their teachers as a way of presumably um, showing their closeness as perhaps you know the favorite student of that um, teacher. Other times they're uh, publishing long-standing um, texts that that have been used. Um, and and the, there will be asides that sort of say that you know um, competing in the printing of, of books is sort of beneficial to to religion. Um, there is a really interesting set of um, fatwas within the um, Al Abbasi collection, um, in which it's quite clear that he, in his capacity as um, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, um, is getting to have um, a say as to uh, uh, sort of which books are permitted to be printing. Um, yeah, and actually I have, um, I have a, a paper that's, that's coming out um, in Ijmis in January in which I describe this. Yeah, thanks. Um, but 
But uh, what's, what's interesting is that his ruling tends to be determined over uh, you know, whether or not the, the uh, religious materials in sync with Hanafism. And then from there, he'll just sort of say things like, no, you can't print this. We already have a printing of this. Printing this book yet again is a waste of time. Or um, you n no, you can't print this silly story because it's just like smut. It's a waste of um, effort. And this this tends to be um, of the something like 22 fatwas that he has in there, um, the basis for his opinion. Now, one of the issues then, and this gets into this topic of um, these governmental structures, is um, yeah, was there a censorship? sort of edifice and, and how did it work because uh, you will find that titles that he's saying no you cannot print are in fact being printed um, <laughs> at that time. So um, sort of unclear. There's a historian of science at Harvard, uh, you probably know Alex, um, is it Chizar? This is our, Chizar, I, yeah. yeah. So we were dissertating at the same time, uh, and I was I, I was a part of a dissertation group um, in the uh, early history of science um, group, uh, and I remember him making a really interesting uh, remark about a chapter that I was presenting uh, that has sort of stayed with me, and it was about I was talking about the question of information overload in this period that I work on, um, and the, how it relates to encyclopedism, and I made a point kind of like what you're making now, which is to say that people don't. Uh, I was frustrated because I was trying to answer the question of why we see this uh, explosion of encyclopedic literature in the 14th century in Cairo, and I was complaining that um, we don't have a whole lot of um, evidence from the sources themselves about why that is the case, and um, and 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 he said, uh, and I was saying, you know, this is this relates to information overload too. People don't talk about, um, you know. This about about the fact that there is so much information and how to manage it, and he was saying he said something along the lines of how um, that you can't you can't go you can't deduce the existence of a phenomenon like information overload uh, from um, testimony at the time, uh, or at least even if it did exist, even if those statements did exist, it wouldn't actually tell you if there was. A problem because one person's experience of, of that kind of a phenomenon is not going to give you a macro level picture, you know, um, of of something that diffuse and that abstract. So I wonder if um, you know wanting to uh, looking for the que answer to the question of why uh, resistance existed, if it did exist, um, looking for contemporary evidence in the form of conscious deliberate uh, diagnoses or statements along those lines. Um, whether it's going to be productive, or whether you know whether we have to kind of abstract it in the way that an older scholarship did, uh, rather than trying to depend on documentary evidence. I I see I see what you're getting at, and and again I um, I, I'm taken by it. But if the overwhelming majority of the scholarships sort of presents Islam as a barrier to print, the burden's sort of on them to offer some evidence. Right. Uh, as well, <laughs> where is this? Where is this necessarily coming from? And I do, I, I do think it's really important to actually look at, at these sources as they're reflecting in time. I mean, perhaps it's it's different with um, too much to know. But um, Ahmed um, Jevdet Pasha, uh, who um, is um, of the compositor of the Ottoman Civil Code, the Majelle, he writes um, in the mid 19th century um, a history, and one of his chapters is uh, has a what he entitles a digression on the art of printing, and um, with within it he sort of says that the the 19th century has been really great because um, there had um, been within the Ottoman context. Um, Adherence to fanaticism uh, within uh, the, I, he doesn't really specify, just says adherence to fanaticism, um, who were sort of a, against printing some religious books. But everybody knows, um, he says, uh, that to everything its purpose. So, so the idea that um, if you put a, and he cites this example, if you put a binding on the Quran, the Holy Quran, you're hammering. <laughs> this this most precious text. Um, if you're printing 
a, a religious book, you're um, putting metal typefaces of, of holy words and you're sort of smushing them against um, a piece of paper, but you're, you're doing it for the benefit of um, spreading uh, knowledge. So, you know, this is just a small like group of, of fanatics and, and everybody sort of knows um, better. So I'm not sure if that's the only thing I've found in, in all the time that I've been uh, looking for some sort of, of reference to a, a sort of um, red line and and if others find more I'm you know a Bayesian I'm very happy to update right. my prior on this but the, the, maybe the, we're approaching it though in the wrong way, this, uh, way it's not so much that okay let, let me try to just create an analogy based on the my uh, area of interest so I spent a long time trying to a fight against a similar prejudice in my area which is like the reason why uh, Muslims or scholars in the Middle East produced uh, and the rest of the Islamic world produced encyclopedias. The, the the old stereotype was because they were unoriginal, and encyclopedic literature was uh, a way you know they they had no, nothing original to say, so they just compiled. And that, this is something a, a stereotype that exists in the European context as well, in the Chinese context too, for encyclopedic literature. And they did this because they also did it because they were trying to glorify a, a golden age, and they had nothing else. There was a sort of a decadence thesis. So I spent a long time trying to, to like debunk this. And also to raise, to, to suggest that it was a bad question in the first place. But it, I came to feel that it's actually not a bad question. The question of why people produce these works remains a supremely interesting question. It was a bad answer, but it's not a bad question um, to say, like, well, why did they write, if, you know, why did they produce these works? They were a huge investment of effort and time. There must have been a reason why they did it. Okay, it wasn't because they, they, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that it was because they were unoriginal or because they were trying to commemorate a golden age or they were afraid of the loss of knowledge. In fact, there's five or six much more compelling and interesting reasons why they did. So I feel like uh, that's I, what I'm sort of suggesting. is like maybe we should say, okay, the, is, the Islam answer is wrong. That's clearly wrong in the case of printing. But there must be some other reasons that have maybe to do with material questions or you know the the question the the problem of literacy, and the vernacular and the cosmopolitan and you know maybe it's just um, I know that the, the data on what uh, what, what literacy looked like before the 19th century is very very thin, but we do know that in the 20th century, you know as late as the 1950s, the literacy among women was was 90 percent across the Middle East. So what was it in the in the 19th century in the 18th century? You know uh, maybe it was just it, it it never made sense to put the capital in place to, to, to for mass production of books because um, copying manuscripts was very efficient and effective and, and uh, for the for the audience that, that, that wanted to read and could read I, I mean I sorry I, I agree um, the efficiency answer is is enormously um, compelling just um a comparative point and, or a contrast point perhaps. I mean, when, when printing really sort of catches on in, in, in China in the 10th and 11th century, um, it isn't necessarily seen as a good thing. I mean, there are many people who, who uh, critique um, uh, printing, um, partly for the sort of elitist reason that, you know, these, uh, particularly printing of the Confucian classics, these are not, these are sacred texts. They shouldn't be um, widely circulated. That, I think, is uh, fairly common. But many people fear, feel that it's um, undermining learning, that people are no longer memorizing texts because books are so easily available. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of our problems is that we're assuming that everybody would see print as a good thing, and I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't know whether any of those reasons would apply in, in your case, but it's very clear. In the, and even, even later in the 18th century, you have uh, what is considered the greatest vernacular novel of the Chinese tradition, um, the author um, deliberately did not want it printed um, because it was, you know, a, a precious work. It was to circulate only within, um, you know, an intimate group of his friends, and, and printing it would, in a sense, destroy it. And, you know, and somebody took it from it and printed it, but and so we still have it. But, but um, you know, I, I think there are all sorts of reasons why print might not necessarily be embraced as a, as a good, yeah. Sure, and, and of course there are studies of, of um, sort of history of printing in the West that show that there are all of these authors that would publish in coteries yeah. Um, yeah. in manuscript form, yeah. small circles, be, because they were sort of resistant of, of these things. But it's, it's a sort of um, broader, broader point. I mean, with regard to your research, Elias, the, the question would be sort of, um, why didn't they write encyclopedias before? 
what's wrong? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm all for answering why. Why are they printing when when the, when they're doing it and 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 what are they explaining about it? But I, I, I don't know how often you have to sort of defend uh, an answer for for why they didn't pull together encyclopedias but before they before they did. Well, no, they did. They did. The, the question is like why they did it, why they did it in the volume that they did at this particular post classical moment. Yeah. Which is a totally valid yeah, uh, yeah question and and a fruitful one. Um, and I guess just on the point of, of um, information overload, um, Anne Blair's written a book called Too Much to Know, precisely about the fact that even the ancients were griping about being bombarded uh, by too much information. So this is the sort of um, long-standing complaint <laughs> that people have, that there's more stuff to get through than one has time to actually um, master. Thank you.